بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيد المرسلين وخاتم النبيين محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين أما بعد فعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم إن الله وملائكته يصلون على النبي يا أيها الذين آمنوا صلوا عليه وسلموا تسليما اللهم صل على محمد وعلى آل محمد كما صليت على إبراهيم وعلى آل إبراهيم إنك حميد مجيد اللهم بارك على محمد وعلى آل محمد كما باركت على إبراهيم وعلى آل إبراهيم إنك حميد مجيد Respect to listeners In just under two weeks we will witness the beginning of the month of Ramadan. We need to prepare ourselves physically, practically, and also mentally for the coming blessed month. We learn from a number of narrations that towards the end of Sha'ban, the Prophet ﷺ, and also during the month and before the month, the Prophet ﷺ addressed the Sahaba عنهم, and spoke to them of not just the virtue of Ramadan and fasting, but also the requirement of not letting the month go to waste, of not being deprived of its good. And there are many such ahadith in relation to this. So similarly, we need to practically, physically and mentally prepare ourselves for the coming month to ensure that we make the most of the month and do not allow it to go to waste. Practically, I'll speak about mentally in a moment, but practically. We can defer some of our work and chores till after Ramadan and also complete as much as we can before the month in the hope of freeing as much as possible of our time for the blessed month. In fact, it's actually the practice of some ulama, even now in this day and age, and it has been so throughout history, that they even keep cooking to a minimum in the month of Ramadan. And they explain to their families, that just as the men have free time to be able to worship, to do tilawah of the Qur'an, the dhikr of Allah, and to free themselves from other tasks and chores and duties, so a similar opportunity should be given to the whole household, so that they don't just spend their entire time or a lot of their time cooking and preparing, and entertaining guests. And so some ulama have this practice of keeping cooking to an absolute minimum in the whole month, only the bare necessities. And in fact, we have a sunnah in that, in the life of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, in that his sahur, his iftar, were very simple. In fact, his meals out of Ramadan were extremely simple. We learned that he would never have two types of dishes in one meal. In fact, he would never fill his, he would never fill himself, he would never eat to his fill with barley and meat. 
and Umm al-Mu'mineen Aisha radiyallahu anha says that never till the day he died did the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam fill himself with barley in any two days. So even over the spread of two days, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam never ever filled his stomach with barley. And the reason for mentioning barley is that wheat was not as common or as preferred as barley. And in fact, in many ways, for health purposes, uh, barley is a better grain than wheat. Also, the Prophet wasallam, a lot of barley used to grow in Medina. And Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. That may sound surprising, but Medina traditionally had much more water than it has now. And many of the valleys used to flow freely with water. And this is why it was regarded as an oasis. And amongst the crops of Medina weren't just dates. But there was wheat, there was barley, and many of the Ansar Sahaba anhum, were farmers because they had lots of cultivations and farms and orchards. And they didn't just specialize in dates, rather, there was a lot of barley as well. And Rasulullah in the later years of his life in Medina, when he gained certain lands, such as from Banu Nadir in the fourth year of Hijrah, some of the lands which the Prophet ﷺ gained himself were actually fields of barley. So Rasulullah ﷺ had his own fields of barley which produced crops, maybe not all the time, but for much of the time. And so Barley was always a preferable grain to wheat. And yet, even from barley, whose fields he had himself, Umm al Mu'mineen Aisha radiallahu anha says that never, of course, he used to give a lot of it in sadaqah. So, a lot of the produce he used to give away. And this is why when he passed away, even though previously, he had fields of barley that came in his possession. Rasulullah passed away and let, departed from this world, having borrowed or having purchased barley on credit from a Jew in Medina, which he then gave to and spread to his family. So Umm Mu'mineen Aisha radiallahu anha says that never did the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam fill his stomach with barley, just barley, in two days. And that remained so till the day he left this world. And that was out of Ramadan. So one can imagine what his meals were like in the month of Ramadan, his sahur, his iftar. But this is another topic altogether. What I wish to point out is that the coming month is a very blessed month. We should prepare ourselves practically and mentally. And part of that mental preparation is that we gear ourselves for the ibadah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that's what the whole month of Ramadan is about. Now, today's talk is titled Ramadan, a spiritual retreat. And the reason for that is that the month of Ramadan is a form of i'tikaf for the entire month. And i'tikaf isn't just what we are accustomed to believing, which is a very particular form of seclusion and retreat in a designated place. Of course, that is a correct meaning of i'tikaf as we know it now, but the original meaning of i'tikaf wasn't that. And 
when we take the wider meaning of i'tikaf, it helps us understand not just the i'tikaf as we know it today better, but it also helps us understand the actual ibadah of fasting and the whole month of Ramadan in its true spirit. Hence the name Ramadan, a spiritual retreat. And this is based on the understanding that the whole month of Ramadan is a form of i'tikaf. And allow me to explain. What does the word i'tikaf actually mean? It comes from the root word uquf in Arabic. And uquf has many derivatives. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions in the Holy Quran, وَأَنْتُمْ عَاكِفُونَ فِي الْمَسَاجِدِ that whilst you are in i'tikaf in the masjids. But then, so here this is a clear mention of i'tikaf in the masjid. But then again, Ibrahim alayhi salam said, and Allah quotes him in the Quran, that ma hadhihi tamathilu allati antum laha aakifun, same word. Allah says, wa antum aakifun fi al-masajid whilst you are in i'tikaf in the masjids. And Ibrahim alayhi salam said to his people, مَا هَذِهِ التَّمَاثِيلُ الَّتِي أَنْتُمْ لَهَا عَاكِفُونَ That what are these idols before which you are doing i'tikaf? So Allah mentions i'tikaf in the masjids, as we know it, but Allah also quotes Ibrahim alayhi salam who mentions i'tikaf in relation to idols. So what is then the original meaning of i'tikaf? I'tikaf simply means for those of you who know Arabic, which means to devote oneself and focus oneself on something to the exclusion of everything else. So when you single-mindedly attach yourself to something, focus on something, and devote yourself to that thing, that is the original meaning of uquf. And this is what Ibrahim alayhi salam was referring to. That his people, just as others, as Allah mentions in the Quran, that we will remain devoted to these idols. That what they would do when they would worship before these idols, then regardless of their actual wording and their prayers, they, the scene was that kneeling, bowing, prostrating, humbling themselves before these idols, they would be focused on their prayer. They would be completely devoted. And sometimes they would spend hours in that manner. So the original meaning of i'tikaf is not even just worship. It actually means to focus yourself, to concentrate on one particular thing to the exclusion of everything else. And a simple translation would be devoting yourself. So this is the meaning of i'tikaf. Now when we take that original meaning of i'tikaf into consideration, then it becomes easier for us to understand Ramadan, the actual i'tikaf in Ramadan, the whole month of Ramadan, fasting as an ibadah in itself. Now the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, it's well known of him. We all know that i'tikaf is sunnah. In fact, the entire ulama, the, uh, throughout the history of Islam, the ulama more or less agree unanimously that i'tikaf is a sunnah. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam did it regularly. And not just in the month of Ramadan. Of course, we famously know that in the final ten days of Ramadan, Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam would perform the i'tikaf. And one of the reasons for doing so, just one of the many, was that he would search for Laylatul Qadr in those 10 days, final 10 days of Ramadan. One. Another thing is that 
In the final year of his life, the Prophet وسلم, did i'tikaf not just for 10 days, but for 20 days. And one of the reasons was that in the final year of his life, the Prophet وسلم, meaning uh, at the final, not the final year, but the final Ramadan that he spent. So the final Ramadan that he spent on earth, he did i'tikaf for 20 days. One of the reasons was that this was connected to the revelation of the Qur'an and his revision of the Qur'an. Every month of Ramadan, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam would revise the Qur'an with Jibreel alayhi salam. And the meaning of revision is that Jibreel alayhi salam would visit him. Jibreel alayhi salam, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam would recite as much of the Qur'an as had been revealed till then to Jibreel alayhi salam and he would listen. And then Jibreel alayhi salam would recite the same Qur'an to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam and he would listen. So this, in Asian languages, this is known as Dawr, which we normally call Dawr. Dawr comes from the word Dawr. And for those of you who have done Hidh or are doing Hidh or whose children and family members are or have done doing or have done Hidh, you'll be familiar with the term door which originally comes from door and the meaning of door is a turn so just as the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam would and jibreel alayhi salam would take turns in reciting the quran to each other one reading the other listening so it was the door of jibreel alayhi salam and then it was the door of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam door simply means a turn so when we use the word door, it just refers to taking turns as Jibreel alayhi salam and the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam used to do. And this is the tradition of muraja'ah, of revision of the Qur'an. So he would do it regularly each Ramadan with Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam. And then in the final Ramadan that he spent, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam made two revisions of the Qur'an with Jibreel alayhi salam. So just as he did... 20 days of i'tikaf, he did two complete revisions of the Qur'an with Jibreel alayhi salatu wassalam. So we know that he would do i'tikaf in Ramadan, that's well known. And in the final Ramadan, he did two i'tikafs, or 20 days of i'tikaf, not just 10, just as he did two complete revisions of the Qur'an. But we also know that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam did i'tikaf out of Ramadan. And... Imam Bukhari, Imam Muslim and others all relate that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam also did i'tikaf in the final 10 days of Shawwal, the month after Ramadan. So, and presumably and most likely that was actually without fasting. So there is a concept of doing i'tikaf without fasting too. So he did i'tikaf even in Shawwal, out of the month of Ramadan. So Ramadan is not, I'tikaf is not restricted to the month of Ramadan. But most interestingly, the I'tikaf of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam began even before Islam. So his sunnah of doing I'tikaf didn't just begin in Medina. And it wasn't just in Mecca before the Hijrah, after the revelation of the Quran. He actually used to do i'tikaf even before the revelation of the Qur'an. Even before the age of 40, when he first received the wahi. Imam Bukhari, rahmatullah, he writes at the beginning, the third hadith which he relates about the beginning of revelation is from Umm al-Mu'mineen Aisha radiyallahu anha. So the third hadith in the book of Sahih al-Bukhari is about the beginning of revelation. And it's from Umm al-Mu'mineen Aisha radiyallahu anha, who says, أَوَّلُ مَا بُدِئَ بِهِ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمْ من الوحي الرؤية الصالحة That the very beginning of receiving of revelation on the part of Rasulullah صلى الله عليه وسلم was actually good, truthful dreams. And he would not see any dream 
except that it would appear like the break of morning. And the meaning of this is that even before receiving the first verses of the Holy Qur'an, Rasulullah alayhi salatu wasalam began seeing dreams. And we learn from other narrations that this was for a period of six months. Rabi'ul awwal is a very important month for a number of reasons. Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was born in the month of Rabi'u al-Awwal. He departed from the world in the month of Rabi'u al-Awwal. He left, Mac- he did hijrah, he arrived in Medina in the month of Rabi'u al-Awwal. And the first verses of the Holy Qur'an he received in the month of Ramadan. But the beginning of this process began in the month of Rabi'ul Awwal when he first started having these clear dreams. So we learn that for six months this process continued of clear dreams. And the meaning of clear dreams is that the Prophet ﷺ would see very clear, vivid dreams that led ultimately to receiving the first verses of the Holy Qur'an. In the words of Ummul Mu'mineen Aisha radiallahu anha, they would be like the break of morning. So when you compare mid-morning brightness and the rays of sunlight in Arabia in the morning, as opposed to the darkness of the night with no lighting whatsoever and no light pollution, the difference between the two was similar to the difference in the dreams of the Prophet ﷺ and other people's dreams. Other people's dreams, we may think they are like reality. When we dream, no one, very few people can actually tell whilst they are dreaming that this isn't reality, that we're only dreaming. We only think that retrospectively. When we wake up, then we realize that we were only dreaming. And sometimes the mind can play tricks with us in making us believe that whilst I was dreaming, I knew I was dreaming. But that's what the mind does retrospectively afterwards. It makes us think that even whilst we were dreaming, we thought and we knew we were dreaming. That's what the mind plants in us afterwards. But whilst we are dreaming, how many of us can tell that this isn't reality, this isn't the world? In fact, people have dreams within dreams. And what they have is that they are dreaming. And then they wake up from a dream. So they realize, oh, I was just dreaming. But they are still actually dreaming. And then they wake up to reality. So when we are dreaming, we think that this is reality. This is the world. This is the truth. And we are frightened. This is why we have nightmares. We talk in our sleep. We scream. We are fearful because our body, even though the brain is actually programmed to prevent the body from reacting to dreams, and it's programmed to keep the body in control during sleep, despite that programming and that control, dreams can be so vivid that they can still bypass that control and that programming of the brain, and make the body react. That's how sharp and vivid and strong these dreams are, and akin to reality. Now we think these dreams are real, but think of this. In comparison to the dreams that the Prophet received in in that period, 
Our dreams are still like the darkness of the night. So despite believing that this is reality, if our dreams are still like the darkness of the night in comparison to the dreams of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, which compared to our dreams were like the bright morning sun and bright daylight, one can just imagine how truthful and how real these dreams of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam were. So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam saw dreams for a period of approximately six months, beginning from Rabi'ul Awwal all the way till the month of Ramadan. Then, Umm al-Mu'mineen Aisha radiyallahu anha says in the same hadith of Bukhari, ثُمَّ حُبِّبِ إِلَيْهِ الْخَلَاء Then solitude was made beloved to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. This means that solitude was made beloved to him. Allah did that. Allah made khalwa, solitude, seclusion, retreat, beloved to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He was driven to it by Allah. And this was during the period of vivid dreams. So Umm al-Mu'mineen Aisha radiyallahu anha says, وَكَانَ يَخْلُو بِغَارِ حِرَائٍ فَيَتَحَنَّثُ فِيهِ وَهُوَ التَّعَبُّدْ أَلَّيَالِيَ ذَوَاتِ الْعَدَدِ Then, after solitude was made beloved to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he would seclude himself in the cave of Hira. And he would worship there. Sorry, فَيَتَحَنَّثُ فِيهِ He would do تَحَنُّثْ therein. He would do تَحَنُّثْ therein. And the meaning of tahannuth is worshipping. And he would do it for a few nights. That means days and nights. Then Umm al-Mu'mineen Aisha radiallahu anha says, he would then return to his family. And for that period that he would remain in the cave of Hira, he would he would actually take provisions with him for that seclusion, for that period. Then he would return to Umm al-Mu'mineen Khadijah radiyallahu anha and she would prepare more provisions for him and then he would return to the cave of Hira. And this process continued. And in another hadith, Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, that I remained secluded in the cave of Hira, Shahra, for a whole month. And we learn from other narrations that which month was this? This was the month of Ramadan. So for a whole month, the Prophet ﷺ remained in the cave of Hira. Now what do we learn from this? is that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam after solitude and seclusion were made beloved to him he was driven to spending time in solitude in seclusion in retreat in the cave of Hira and he'd spend a few days there come home prepare take provisions go back spend a few more days but then there came a time when he spent an entire month In the cave of Hira. And then Umm al-Mu'mineen Aisha radiallahu anha also says that he would remain secluded in the cave of Hira hatta ja'ahu al-haq until the truth came to him. And that was in the form of Jibreel alayhi salam bringing him the first words of the Holy Qur'an. So let's think about this. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam would spend many days and nights alone in the cave of Hira. Now today, Mecca al-Mukarramah is a vast city with millions residing in the city. However, in those days before Islam, Mecca wasn't very large at all. And even though it was regarded as a city, owing to the small populations of the time, It was actually less populated 
than some villages in parts of the world today. And with no artificial lighting at night, with no light pollution, one can just imagine the surroundings of Mecca at night. And yet in that period, the Prophet ﷺ would leave Mecca to Mukarramah alone and travel to the cave of Hira, which if we accept that it is where it is today, is at a distance of a few miles, a few, a few miles from the center of the city. The Prophet ﷺ would travel there all alone, climb all the way up to this hidden cave and then remain there in solitude, alone, with no one around, no sound, no people, in total silence. And he would remain there in solitude, not for one or two hours, but for days and nights. And before the revelation of the Qur'an for the whole month. And that was actually the month of Ramadan. And slightly before. So he remained there. Alone. One could just imagine. The loneliness, the solitude. And then, what would he do? Umm al-Mu'mineen Aisha radiyallahu anha says... So he would seclude himself in the cave of Hira and he would do tahannuth therein. And the meaning of tahannuth, again for those of you who are students of Arabic, he would protect himself from Tahajjud, one of the meanings of tahajjud, uh, again, for the students of Arabic, tafa'ul, the verb of tafa'ul includes salb and ijtinab. So, ta'atham means tajannaba'an al-ithm. Tahannath, tajannaba'an al-hinth. Tahajjud, tajannaba'an al-hajjud, wal-hujud. One of the meanings of tahajjud is that you distance yourself from lying down. Ta'atham, ta'atham means you distance yourself from ithm, sin. Tahannuth means you distance yourself from hinth, which also means sin. So the Prophet ﷺ would do tahannuth, and the meaning of tahannuth is he would distance himself and protect himself from sin. And that was one of the purposes of secluding himself. So the Prophet ﷺ would go away from Mecca, from the hustle bustle of the city, and distance himself from everything and everyone in the clear air and climate of the desert, alone in a cave. And this in itself was the meaning of ibadah, because we do not know from the narrations what kind of ibadah the Prophet ﷺ did. Salah wasn't introduced as we know it. There was no tilawah of the Qur'an as the Qur'an had not been revealed. So what would the Prophet ﷺ do for all these days and nights? Well, the act of seclusion in itself meant so much. One, and he would reflect on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He would devote himself to Allah Azza wa Jal in a particular way. Without even the ritual forms of ibadah as we know it. And that would just mean sitting and reflecting on Allah Azza wa Jal. Not for one or two hours, but for entire days, nights, for weeks, for a whole month. Now what benefit was that? What, sorry, what benefit was there in this? This is what actually led him. And remember, he didn't do this to earn and win profited. He didn't do this to acquire profited. 
as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, In Surah Al-Duha, Allah found you in search and he guided you. Allah found you in search and he guided you. So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa was driven to solitude and seclusion. And when he did this, he wasn't hoping for prophethood. He wasn't asking for that special privilege and position. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala still guided him to it. And this whole process of clear and vivid dreams, brighter than the crack of morning, than the break of morning, these vivid dreams, this love of solitude, this reflection on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, this retreat, this seclusion, this distancing himself from everything and everyone else, this whole process eventually led him to the time and place where, of when, of when and which, Umm al-Mu'mineen Aisha radiyallahu anha says, Hatta ja'ahu al-haq, until the truth came to him. And then Jibreel alayhi salam visited him. This is what seclusion led him to. This is what solitude led him to. This is what the love of loneliness led him to. And remember, this practice was known to the Arabs. It was known to the non-Arabs. Even before Islam, from the time of the great prophet, Isa ibn Maryam alayhi salam, his followers would also retreat into seclusion. And although some took this too far, as Allah Azza wa Jal says in the Quran, وَرَحْبَانِيَةً اِبْتَدَعُوهَا مَا كَتَبْنَاهَا عَلَيْهِمْ إِلَّا اِبْتِغَاءَ رِضْوَانِ اللَّهِ فَمَا رَعُوهَا حَقَّ رِعَايَتِهَا That that monsticism, which they invented, we did not decree it for them. But still they did it. إِلَّا اِبْتِغَاءَ رِضْوَانِ اللَّهِ Seeking the countenance of Allah, seeking Allah's pleasure. Unfortunately, for ma ra'uha haqqa ri'ayatiha, they were not able to keep it as it, should have been, as it should have been kept. They were not mindful of it as they should have been mindful of it. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala approved some of this seclusion, this retreat, and this monasticism that they practiced. But unfortunately, they took it to extremes. And part of that extreme was that they, unfortunately, they would pride themselves on... This was some of the, monarch, uh, of the monks and the hermits of the desert. They would pride themselves on self-flagellation. So they would whip themselves, beat themselves. That was disapproved of, obviously. So self-flagellation was disapproved of, the beating and punishing of oneself physically was disapproved of. That was part of the monasticism that Allah disliked and disapproved, and that was part of the extreme monasticism that they practiced. Another one was absolute celibacy, and some of them would practice standing on one spot for hours and hours on end, again there was no purpose to that. So seclusion was good. Distancing oneself from everything and everyone else in order to focus and devote oneself to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was good. But self-flagellation, punishment, these kind of awkward things were disapproved of. And a lot of these sincere followers of Isa ibn Maryam, Prophet Jesus alayhi salam, were hermits. And this monasticism, this solitude, this loneliness actually led them to great things. They attained great spirituality. And this is actually known in the East too. Remember, the spiritual world exists. And we can't deny it. And part of materialism is the belief that the only thing that exists is matter. And there is no spiritual realm. 
whatsoever. And yet, the people of the East, including their philosophers, have always believed in the spiritual world. Separate from religion. So even the ancient non-Muslim philosophers <clears throat> believed in a world beyond this physical, material world. And they actually tapped into it. And they can tap into it. So, Confucius, even Buddha, and others. These ancient Chinese and Indian philosophers, monks and hermits, they actually displayed tremendous feats of spirituality. I don't mean Islamic spirituality, just spirituality in the sense that they tapped into the non-material spiritual world beyond the physical realm as we know it. This is why they have in the past, and they still continue to, practice amazing feats of remaining hungry and thirsty for days, weeks on end. One, of meditating, of staying in one spot, of absolute calm, of practicing and exercising mind over matter, self-discipline, control, of withstanding pain. And these strange terms that we hear of, of being able to harness the inner power such as chi, We may laugh at some of this. Martial artists, especially from China and the Far East, they practice harnessing the power of qi, the inner power. Others, they are able to meditate and for days on the end, and they remain very calm. They are hardly ever provoked. People can punch them and they won't react. They are able to withstand pain, such as walking over coal, burning coal, hot embers. People hitting them, striking them, and they being able to absolutely withstand all of this and control their pain with mind over matter. How do they do this? They tap into the spiritual world, into that f world beyond the physical world. So whether it's the ancient Chinese and Indian philosophers, hermits and monks, or whether these were the Christian monks of the deserts of North Africa, of Arabia, whether these were the monks and the nuns of other periods, and even of Europe in the ancient world, they were able to display tremendous feats and achievements because they tapped into that spiritual world. And it can be tapped into as long as one moves away from the physical realm. You can't be in the physical world all the time and still tap into that spiritual world. You have to somehow move away, even temporarily. You can't be in both worlds at the same time. And this is one of the reasons why Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, when he moved away, from Makkah al Mukarramah and secluded himself in the cave of Hira, alone in the darkness of those nights, for days and nights on end, with a little food, with no one to keep him company, not even members of his family. And he devoted himself to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He secluded himself. He went into that retreat. He focused on Allah Azza wa Jalla. And as we know, we were. None of the narrations tell us how he would worship Allah in those days and nights in the solitude and the retreat of the cave of Hira. What we do know is that there was no Qur'an for him to read. There was no Salah as we know it's for him to perform. There was no other ritual form of worship as we know it that's been mentioned in any of the narrations of the cave of Hira. This is why the ulama say that most likely he spent that entire time only in tafakkur, i.e. in reflecting on Allah. 
in focusing on Allah in pondering Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and in some way communicating with Allah <coughs> and what did that seclusion lead him to he didn't just manage to tap into a small part of the spiritual world no Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala prepared him for the coming of Jibreel and the revelation of the Holy Quran. And that was no small thing. Even though Allah destined for him to be who he was, even though Allah Azza wa Jal prepared him and was preparing him for a whole period. In fact, Allah Azza wa Jal had made him Nabi and Rasul and who he was from the beginning of creation. Of course, Allah Azza wa had destined that. But the practical preparation itself took not only his lifetime, but the intense preparation for receiving the words of the Holy Quran began six months earlier with clear, vivid dreams, which as I explained, we shouldn't just think, oh, they were clear dreams. No, our dreams that we think are reality are like night compared to the dreams that the Prophet ﷺ saw in those six months before the revelation of the Qur'an. And that intense preparation, all the way up to six months, before the coming of Jibreel ﷺ, with the words of the Qur'an, even that preparation, when the spiritual world opened up before him, what was the ultimate reaction of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa He was filled with awe and fright. And he ran to Umm al-Mu'mineen Khadija radiyallahu anha and told her, throw water on me, cover me, cover me. And he was trembling in fever. Umm al-Mu'mineen Khadija radiyallahu anha had to reassure him. So with all of that preparation, with just one meeting with Jibreel alayhi salam, and with just five verses of the Holy Qur'an, despite all of that preparation, that was the power that the spiritual world had on the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam. That other world had. And just for that little amount, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala prepared him practically in such a way as Umm Mu'mineen Aisha radiyallahu anha says, then solitude was made beloved to him, meaning Allah made loneliness and solitude beloved to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala prepared him in that manner. Now, I've gone into this lengthy explanation to show that retreat seclusion, solitude, is a necessary requirement for being able to access that spiritual world beyond the physical world. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us that opportunity in ibadah and especially in the month of Ramadan. And not just in the final 10 days, if we do i'tikaf, our whole Ramadan should be a retreat. Our fasting should be a retreat. Our salah should be a retreat. And this is the meaning of mentally prepare ourselves. Because the reality is we are given this opportunity five times a day. But how often can we, do we, make our salah a form of i'tikaf? A retreat from the world. Do we? We hardly ever do. Now, how is salah a form of i'tikaf, a form of seclusion, a retreat? When we begin salah, the first takbir is known as takbiratul ihram. That's one of the names. You can call it tahrima, you can call it the first takbir, you can call it the tahreem. You can also call it the takbir of tahreem. And you can also call it the takbir of ihram. So it's known as takbiratul ihram. Now, we know the meaning of ihram. Or we've, we are familiar with the term ihram. And what's ihram? We normally associate it with the clothing for umrah and hajj the two simple pieces of cloth for men. 
and restricted clothing for women, specific for Umrah and Hajj. Now that's a common meaning of ihram, but originally ihram did not mean, and still doesn't mean, I'm not saying it's wrong to use it, yes, we all use the words ihram for the clothing of Hajj and Umrah. Ihram originally means Making something sacred. That's the original meaning of ihram. Making something sacred. And in fact, making something haram. And the original meaning of haram isn't unlawful, isn't something bad. The original meaning of haram is also sacred. That's why we have al masjid al haram. The sacred precinct, the sacred masjid. And the idea was that any area which is sacred is also forbidden. You couldn't enter it. A sacred area, you had to tread very carefully. And it was normally forbidden. You weren't allowed to enter that area. And that's why the Prophet sallallahu says in a hadith related by Bukhari and others from an numar ibn Bashir radiyallahu an, ala inna li kulli malikin hima. Know that every king has a, a sanctuary. Hima doesn't mean boundary, it means a sanctuary. Know that every king has a sanctuary. And traditionally the Arabs, when they would travel, since there were nomads, the leader of the tribe, he would claim, he would stake his first claim on a number of things. One of the things he would do is that when he, was when he would travel, they would set up his tent in a certain place, and then a boundary was created, an artificial boundary. Sometimes as far as the howling or the barking of a dog could be heard, etc., and then it was announced to the rest of the tribe that the chief, this is his sanctuary. No one else can hunt or claim any animals or allow their own animals to graze in this sanctuary. All grazing, herding, capturing of prey and other animals must take place for everyone else outside this small area which was now the hima, the boundary, sorry, the sanctuary of the king. In fact, even now, who doesn't know Genghis Khan? Who hasn't heard of him? Now, when Genghis Khan died, his followers, remember he was a nomad as well, a nomadic chieftain. When he died, his followers set up a hima, a sanctuary, of approximately 200 square miles around his grave, burial place. And no one knows the exact burial place, but they set up a boundary of 200 square miles. And that boundary is actually still honoured till today, that sanctuary. So they call it the forbidden area, approximately 200 square miles. So the Prophet sallallahu says, Allah inna li kulli malikin hima, know that every king has a sanctuary. And that sanctuary is forbidden. And the Prophet sallallahu says, wa inna hima Allahi maharim. So what can be said of the king of kings? And indeed the sanctuary of Allah are his forbidden sins. So, everything which Allah has made forbidden, as part of Allah's sanctuary, do not go anywhere near it. So the meaning of haram originally was something sacred. And something sacred is something forbidden. You don't go there because it's forbidden. Not because it's bad, but because it's too good. That was the original meaning of haram. 
And we still have Al-Masjid Al-Haram. And the meaning of Ihram, therefore, is to make something Haram which is sacred. So when we say Allahu Akbar, we do and say a number of things. We stand facing the Qibla. We prepare ourselves with wudu. We wash ourselves richly in a manner as though we are washing away our connection with the dunya. Now we can't do ghusl before every salah. So Islam has reduced the process of purification from the full ghusl. Understand this. It'd be too much to do ghusl before every salah. So Islam has reduced the full ghusl to just a symbolic ghusl. And the symbolic ghusl, the symbolic bathing, is to wash not the entire body, but those parts of the body that are commonly exposed. So the face, and it should have been the whole head as well. But then again to reduce the requirement, instead of washing the entire head thoroughly, we are merely required to pass water over with a wet hand. So to do masa. Again, that's just to reduce the burden. But to wash the full face, and actually the whole head, that's exposed. But the head with just the masa. And then the hands and the arms. And then the feet. Because these are the common areas of exposure. But why only these areas? The reason is that they symbolize and they represent the entire body. And in reality, we should be doing ghusl for the whole body before every salah. But to reduce the burden, we aren't required to do ghusl before every salah. We're only required to do wudu, which represents ghusl. One. Two. It should have been wudu before every salah. But again, to reduce the burden, as long as we haven't broken and violated that wudu, we are able to repeat as many salah as we can and as we want with the same wudu. That's just to reduce the burden. So in order to stand before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, think of the process, we wash ourselves from the world. So in a way, we're actually doing ghusl. So we wash ourselves. We wash the dunya away from us. We wash our hands, our entire body of the dunya. Then we stand before Allah and we face one particular direction. And that means devotion, focus, concentration. Once we've done that, we raise our hands. And this is again symbolic in the sense that we throw the dunya and the world behind us. So we raise our hands. We are throwing the dunya and the world behind us. We shun, we renounce everything. And once we've done that, we say Allahu Akbar. And the saying of Allahu Akbar marks the consecration of our prayer. It ties the knot. This, with the words Allahu Akbar, with that declaration, with that pronouncement, we now make our state sacred. We make our state haram. And once we say Allahu Akbar, what do we do now? We are now in the sacred and haram state of salah, where things are forbidden. So in reality, this whole process leads us into a form of i'tikaf. Our salah is a retreat. It's a seclusion. It's a renunciation of the world. We don't talk with anyone else. We don't look left or right. We don't speak. We don't eat. We don't drink. All of that is physical. We don't even turn away. All of that is physical. But spiritually and mentally, we should be aiming for focusing on just Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, on the words of Allah azza wa jal, on our ibadah, on our prayer, on our communication, because we are in conversation with Allah. That's mental. And this in itself is a form of retreat. When we do salam, one of the phrases referring to salam is tahleel. 
which means making halal. So when we say assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullah, assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullah, why say salam? Is it just because when we complete our salah, we are now just spreading greetings? No. The reason for salam is we had retreated into a different world. We had secluded ourselves. We had secluded ourselves. We had retreated into a different realm. We had entered into a haram state in which we had forbidden so many things, including speech, communication with the world, contact with the world. And if we can take our salah to the best position, then we had actually made any thought of the world haram on ourselves. We were away. We were absent. We were in a different world. And then, when we finish our salah, we end the haram state by making ourselves and our state halal again. And that's marked with words. We have to have some sort of declaration for that. So just as we had a declaration for entering into the haram sacred state by saying Allahu Akbar, we now have a declaration for exiting the haram state, which is Assalamu Alaikum. And that's why the Tasleem of Salah is also known as Tahleel, the making of halal, making ourselves halal. So why do we say Salam? So why, and why was the declaration Allahu Akbar why was that declaration chosen for the process of entering into the sacred state? Why? Because we remove ourselves from the world and we present ourselves before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We gradually come into the presence of Allah. So when we come into the presence of Allah, we greet Allah. First, when you come into someone's presence, you greet them. And the greeting of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when we usher ourselves into his sacred presence is with the words. The first words are simply, O oh Allah, you are the greatest. That is our declaration of entering into the sacred state. And why that particular declaration? Because we usher ourselves into the presence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And in doing so, the first words that we say to Allah are, O oh Allah, you are the greatest. With that, we begin our communication and our conversation with Allah. When we end that, we end with a prayer just before leaving. And then, when we leave the noble presence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and we exit the haram state, and we once, en once again enter the halal state of the dunya, we do it by meeting the world again. By meeting everyone else again. By exiting that sacred world and coming back into the normal, coming back into the normal world, and the first people that we see in the normal world are those around us. So this is why the greed, the declaration chosen for that exiting, is just as the declaration chosen for entering the sacred world is greeting Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. The declaration for exiting the sacred world is greeting the people. That's why we say assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullah and assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullah. This is a reason. So the whole of salah is a retreat. It's a seclusion. We're actually entering into a haram state. So ihram isn't just for hajj. We enter into a haram state. And as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Al-Baqarah, Al-Hajj ashurum ma'lumat, faman farada fihinna al-hajj fala rafatha wala fusuqa wala jidala fil hajj. The Hajj is a period of nine months. So whoever makes Hajj obligatory on themselves, and the meaning of making Hajj obligatory upon themselves in these nine months, it, it means entering into the state of Ihram. So again, we enter into the state of Ihram. Ihram isn't the clothing. Ihram is a sacred state. So one could actually be in a state of Ihram without the clothing. And one could be with the Ihram, with the clothing, but not in the state of ihram. So ihram is a state, just like the salah was a state of being in a haram state. The ihram is a state. Again, how do you mark getting into that state? It's done with a declaration. So how do you 
You can put on the clothing. You can ready yourself. But you need a declaration. You need a mark. Which shows that you have now exited the halal state into a haram state. So how is that done? It's done with labbaik. Labbaik, Allahumma labbaik. Labbaik, la sharika laka labbaik. Inna alhamda wa ni'mata laka wal mulk. La sharika lak. Again, labbaik, I present myself before you. Repetition, I present myself before you. Presence, presence. Presence, presence. Oh Allah, presence, presence. This is how we announce our presence before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the state of ihram. Once we are in Allah's presence, we are away from the dunya. All normal things become haram for us. And that's in the ihram of Hajj and Umrah. And then again, to exit that haram state, there is a physical declaration. We shave ourselves, our heads, etc. And there are other markings. Similar is the sacred state of fasting. This is why I say even fasting is a retreat. How do we fast? Just as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says of ihram, and I'll, I'll mention this in a moment, but how do we fast? We normally have a niyyah, and the niyyah is sufficient. But we make, we enter into a haram state. Fasting is a sacred state. Now, to understand the state of fasting, compare it with Hajj and Umrah. What does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala say in the Holy Quran? about the state of ihram فَمَنْ فَرَضَ فِيهِنَّ الْحَجْ فَلَا رَفَثْ وَلَا فُسُوقُ وَلَا جِدَارٍ Whoever makes ihram, uh, hajj obligatory on themselves in these months, that's by entering into the state of ihram. Then Allah mentions three things. Lots of things are haram. Lots of things are haram in ihram of hajj and umrah. But Allah only mentions three things. He doesn't mention the Removal of hair, which is haram. He doesn't mention the applying of fragrance, which is haram. He doesn't mention the clipping of nails, which is haram. Allah doesn't mention any of these things. What Allah chooses to mention is something which was haram even out of ihram. Three things. So in ihram, you have a number of things which become haram, which were already halal. The trimming of hair, the clipping of nails, the application of fragrance, conjugal relations, etc. These were halal, now they've become haram. But surprisingly, Allah speaks about ihram, doesn't mention any of the haram things of ihram that were halal before, which suddenly became haram. Rather, Allah only mentions three things which were haram anyway. Why? It's because Allah wishes to lay emphasis on these three things. That these are haram anyway, but even more so in the state of ihram, we all seem to be careful about removal of hair, application of fragrance. We all are in ihram. I shouldn't do this, I should be careful. No clipping of nails, no trimming of hair, no application of fragrance. We are extremely careful. Well, we become quite absent-minded and complacent about other things that we are so accustomed to. Because these haram things we do day in, day out. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is reminding us, avoid these things now, especially. And the three things which he mentions in the state of ihram are, rafath, fusuq, jidal. They are, rafath means vulgarity, lewdness, indecency, even verbally. That's rafath. Number two, Fusuq, sinfulness. And number three, jidal, quarreling. Now remember these three. And one of the most famous hadith, an authentic hadith, about fasting, related by Imam Bukhari, Imam Muslim and others. <coughs> Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, وَإِذَا كَانَ يَوْمُ صَوْمِ أَحَدِكُمْ And so when one of you is fasting on any day, Now what, fasting is a sacred state. What was halal now becomes haram. So what was halal? Eating was halal, it's become haram. Drinking was halal, it's now become haram. Conjugal relations were halal, they've now become haram. 
So the Prophet وسلم, while speaking about fasting, warns us. But just like Allah in that verse, he doesn't warn us about those things that were halal and have become haram in the sacred state of fasting. Just like Allah, he warns us about those things which were haram anyway, but which we have become so accustomed to that we need reminding of with emphasis. And just like Allah, what does he say? Subhanallah, the correlation between the words of Allah and his Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam about the sacred states of ihram in hajj and umrah and ihram in siyam in fasting. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, وَإِذَا كَانَ يَوْمَ الصَّوْمَ إِحَدِكُمْ When one of you is fasting, what shouldn't he do? فَلَا يَرْفُثْ Let him not do رَفَثْ Just as Allah says there, فَلَا رَفَثْ Let there be no indecency. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, فَلَا يَرْفُثْ Let him not be indecent or vulgar in speech. وَلَا يَسْخَبْ And let him not shout or raise his voice. فَإِنْ سَابَهُ أَحَدٌ أَوْ قَاتَلَهُ And if someone quarrels with him, abuses him, or actually quarrels with him, then what should he do? فَلْيَقُلْ إِنِّمْ رُؤْمْ صَائِمْ Then he should simply say, I am a fasting person. So again, no quarreling. No rafath, no sinfulness, no quarreling. These things were haram anyway. But Allah and His Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa emphasize them again for both Hajj, Umrah and fasting. Because ultimately we enter into a sacred state. And we need to guard and preserve that sacred state. So fasting is a sacred state. Salah is a sacred state. The whole of Ramadan is a sacred state. And we should treat it as a retreat. We should treat it as a form of i'tikaf. I'tikaf isn't just physical. This is why we can be in i'tikaf and yet have no i'tikaf whatsoever. How? People are in the masjid. They're in the masjid of Allah. In the final 10 days of Ramadan, they are in the sacred state of i'tikaf. Let's speak of ourselves. Allah forbid that I be in the masjid. In the final 10 days of Ramadan, in i'tikaf, with the intention of sunnah i'tikaf, planning to stay for the whole 10 days and never leaving the masjid. I'm fasting in those 10 days. So a dual i'tikaf, the i'tikaf of the masjid, the i'tikaf of fasting, the i'tikaf of state of fasting. I'm in seclusion, I'm supposedly in retreat from the world. And yet there I am sitting on my smartphone, Surfing the net. I'm not saying it's haram. I'm just saying that I can be in i'tikaf and yet not be in i'tikaf. I'm surfing the net. I'm attached to the world. I don't, but I could be reading gossip. Vain worldly news. Irrelevant things. And then having finished from my browsing session, I could then have a friend sit next to me and whilst being in the i'tikaf, secluded inside a tent, I could be engaged in conversation with another person in i'tikaf, in the masjid, in the state of fast, both of us, backbiting someone else and engaging in the verbal sin of backbiting. And so, I am in the centre of the masjid, maybe right next to the mimbar and the musalla and the sajjad of the imam. Maybe I am the imam. I am the Imam. I've just finished leading Salah. And I'm in my tent, surrounded by students. And I'm engaged in backbiting. SubhanAllah. I could be in i'tikaf and yet have no i'tikaf. Because i'tikaf isn't just a physical state. It's a mental state. It's an emotional state. It's a spiritual state. The real meaning of i'tikaf, not just inside the masjid, is a retreat from the whole world. Just as Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam retreated from the dunya. 
you have to detach yourself from the physical world to tap into that spiritual world. And it has to be a complete break. It's like going from one room to another, one world to another, one realm to another, one complete state to another. You can't have your feet in both places at the same time. And that's the meaning of A'tikaf. And this is what Ramadan is designed to do. This is why the whole atmosphere of Ramadan changes. We should be doing this five times a day with our salah, but it's not easy. Can you imagine? The Prophet ﷺ was in retreat and in seclusion from this world whenever he would be engaged in the dhikr of Allah. But even more so in salah. This is why on that famous occasion when he led salatul kusuf, he led salatul kusuf, the prayer for the eclipse of the sun. And that was on the day that his son had died. Ibrahim radiyallahu anhu. Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was leading Salah and he suddenly took a step back. And prior to that, he took a step forward. And he told the Sahaba Radiallahu Anhum, Do you know why I stepped forward? Do you know why I stepped back? The reason for his stepping back in Salah was that a flame of the fire of Jahannam leapt out. And the reason for stepping forward is that the Prophet saw one of the bun- one of the saw a bunch of the grapes of Jannah, and he moved forward to take it. And had he been able to take it, the people of the world would have consumed just from that one bunch of grapes till the end of time. Now the, the, the purpose of mentioning this is that the salah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa was such that Jannah and Jahannam opened up before him. In salah, whilst he was on, his feet were planted on earth and yet his retreat from the world was so complete that Jannah and Jahannam were before him. Physically, not just mentally. So imagine the retreat of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. We we should be able to do some of that five times a day, but it's difficult. We should be able to do that whenever we have nafl fasting. And it's much easier to do it in a nafl fast than it is to do it five times a day in salah. Because the hunger and the thirst it sharpens our consciousness. It does. And it, foc- it helps us focus. It really does. So it's easier in occasional fasting than it is in regular five times salah. Because we're so accustomed to it. But then the easiest time when, Allah's, when the time when Allah has made it easiest for us is in the month of Ramadan. Everything changes. The climate changes, the atmosphere changes, the rewards change, the shayateen are chained. The doors of Jannah are flung open, the doors of Jahannam are slammed shut. Mercy reaches the people. Angels descend. Angels make nightly announcements. There is regular forgiveness. There is an atmosphere, a climate, a period of forgiveness, of mercy. There is a change in the air, in the world. All of that helps people in spending Ramadan and the fasts of Ramadan in a special way. And therefore, we should try to make our whole Ramadan a spiritual retreat, a time of seclusion. A time of i'tikaf. I'tikaf isn't just being in one particular place. I'tikaf, of course, that's what the Prophet ﷺ did, and that's a sunnah of i'tikaf, and there are all the laws attached to it. But I'm not talking about the laws of i'tikaf, I'm talking about the spirit of i'tikaf. And the spirit of i'tikaf means that you could be in i'tikaf and yet have no i'tikaf whatsoever. 
And yet, at the same time, you could be out of conventional i'tikaf and be in a state of i'tikaf. So, you could be, strictly speaking, you could be in the marketplace. You could be in the marketplace and yet be in a state of i'tikaf. There are some ulama who are trade. There is no harm in trading, in working, in doing business. People ask, why did the Prophet wasallam stop trading? He was a trader and he was a merchant. But after Nubuwa, why did he stop trading? He did. The Prophet wasallam more or less stopped trading after the revelation of the Holy Quran. Why? Yes, for Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, his was now a completely new position. And it wasn't befitting his status to be a trader, to continue as a trader whilst being a Nabi and a messenger of Allah. But he lived a normal life. He went to the marketplace, he shopped. And that's one of the things that the Quraysh couldn't understand. What kind of prophet is he? We expect an angel, perfect in every sense. And they used to say, مَالِ هَذَا الرَّسُولِ يَأْكُلُ الطَّعَامُ وَيَمْشِي فِي الْأَسْوَاقِ مَالِ هَذَا الرَّسُولِ يَأْكُلُ الطَّعَامُ وَيَمْشِي فِي الْأَسْوَاقِ well, What is it with this messenger? He eats food and he walks in the markets. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told even about Maryam alayhi salam and even about Isa alayhi salam, kana ya'kulani ta'am, they would both eat food. That even, even Jesus, who is hailed as God and the Son of God, and even Mary, who is hailed as the Mother of God, they needed to eat. And they would eat. So even the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam, Ate, walked in the marketplace, he shopped for his needs, he carried out his chores. As Umm Mu'mineen Aisha radiallahu anha says, when she was asked, what would the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam do at home? She says he would do what men do. That means what real men do. So what do real men do at home? She explains, Allahu Akbar. Kana fi mihnati ahlih. He would be in the service of his family. That's what real men do. He would be in the service of his family. He would patch his clothes himself. He would milk the goat himself with his noble hands. He would repair his sandals. He would remove lice from his clothes and blankets himself. Then when it was time for Salah, he would get up and he'd leave for Salah. That's what real men do. They do housework. Allah grant us the tawfiq. I know we don't do it, but we should attempt to follow in the footsteps of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam. So she says, when she was asked, what would he do? She says he would do what men do. So the Prophet ﷺ lived a normal life, but as far as trading, he, he stopped being a trader in the traditional sense that he was before. What? But ulama, just like the Sahaba anhum, many of them were traders. Imam Bukhari was a trader. Many ulama, Imam Abu Hanifa rahimahullah, was a trader. So there's no harm in earning a living. We have to in trading and doing business. So there were many ulama who used to trade in the marketplace and what would they do subhanallah one alim and we're not talking about the classical scholars many centuries ago one alim of the last century he was a trader and he used to have a market stall in the middle of the market in a marketplace and he was a hafiz of the quran and he was an alim a scholar and he used to buy and he used to sell. And whilst he was sitting at the market stall, he would be reciting the Holy Quran. And his habit was 
that in the market, not even at home and not throughout the day, but just in the hours that he would sit in the marketplace, every single day he would complete one whole Qur'an. One whole Qur'an. And not just absent-mindedly, but with devotion. And by heart, uh, uh, I mean by heart. One whole Qur'an, every single day. So you can be in the middle of the marketplace, and yet be in i'tikaf, in the spirit of i'tikaf. If you are removed from the world mentally, emotionally, and spiritually, though physically you are there. That is a real meaning of i'tikaf. It's not about physical i'tikaf, it's about mental, spiritual, and emotional. And the reason for being, it being physical is that that's what helps you. So when you plant yourself in seclusion in the masjid, it should help you. Achieve that mental, emotional, and spiritual i'tikaf of retreat, retreat and seclusion. But the one does not necessarily guarantee the other. So you can be in physical i'tikaf and not be in i'tikaf at all. And some people are so enlightened that they could be physically not in a state of i'tikaf, but in reality actually in a state of i'tikaf mentally and emotionally and spiritually. Ramadan, the whole month, is a state of i'tikaf. Let us mentally prepare ourselves for the coming month. And I pray that Allah enables us to prepare ourselves mentally and spiritually and to make our fasts and our whole time in the blessed month, whether in or out of the masjid, Allah enable us to make it a form of i'tikaf, a form of seclusion, a form of retreat from this dunya, and a form of attachment and devotion with Allah and devotion to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I end with this. Wasallallahu wa sallam ala abdihi wa rasulih nabiyyina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Subhanakallahum wa bihamdik nashadu wa la ilaha illa ant. Nastaghfiruka wa natubu ilayhi.